Welcome everybody. I'm uh, David Eichels with David Richard Gallery here in New York City. Uh, we're located at 211 East 121st Street in uh, East Harlem. And uh, tonight we're having a, a panel discussion in the gallery and uh, behind us uh, is the work we'll be discussing, <coughs> which is by artist uh, Leo Valador. And we'll give a little bit of a background about Leo and, and uh, open it up to questions to people here in the audience. And um, <coughs> so what I'd like to do though right now is introduce our panelists and, and as usual, we'll keep these sort of casual and you know, people should feel free to ask questions and, and you guys chime in whenever you want. Um, so to the right of me is Alex Bacon. He's an art historian, a critic and a arts writer. Um, he lives here in New York City and, um, and he's uh, approached us uh, about Leo's work because he's very interested in um, minimalism and uh, painting and painters and so uh, he's covered a number of people uh, here in town and he's you know, always working on new projects so he approached us and uh, I asked him if he'd participate in this panel I thought his perspectives and his knowledge of other artists would be very interesting and, and uh, give some interesting and different insights into Leo as you know we're always trying to uh, Leo's passed away a number of years ago back in 1989 um, but we're always trying to find people who uh, knew Leo, have done a lot of research, and uh, be able to kind of get more behind the work, uh, sort of what he was thinking and, and uh, <clears throat> different motivations. Uh, and we'll cover some of the work and the, uh, the breadth of the work and what have you tonight. And then further down is Peter Reginato. He's an artist here in New York. He moved here, well, he's also from California, met Leo um, in uh, San Francisco and they both ended up moving here in the early 1960s. And so um, Peter knew him uh, quite a bit when he was here in New York. Um, didn't stay in touch too much, you said, after he'd left, but you, you stayed in touch. And yeah. So uh, this I is- I knew him when, because of the Park Place connection. Yeah. Was, you know. That tended to be the connection with a, <laughs> a lot of people. Uh, Peter knew all those guys, but was not um, uh, a member of that uh, gallery. He instead was with uh, Tabor Dinaj on the Upper East Side. So um, anyway, what we'd like to do tonight is, and I've given each of the guys a little bit of background in terms of just sort of what I'm thinking. Um, there's some obvious things about Leo's work um, that are very, make it very distinct and unique. Um, and those are always um, a great starting point. But like I said, what we're trying to do, and the reason why we record these is uh, for scholarship purposes to try and uh, capture you know, nuggets of information or insights that people have. Uh, there are a lot of people you know, in the audience who've known Leo or know of his work and, and what have you, so we always welcome uh, people's inputs. So um, <clears throat> what I'll do is give just a little bit of background and we can kind of jump in and, um, and if there's some opening thoughts that the, the other panelists have, um, that'd be terrific. Um, and we can kind of get started that way. Uh, so Leo uh, was a painter and uh, was uh, from the Fillmore District in, um, in San Francisco. So he grew up and was part of that early uh, beat uh, scene in San Francisco, which is this whole fusion of, um, which is probably a good word that I think describes a lot of just the essence of Leo, which is fusion. And, uh, and we'll sort of touch a little bit more on that as we go along, but uh, it was a fusion of, of uh, jazz and uh, poetry and, and art. And, and so uh, he was part of all of that uh, back at that time, which was very interesting. And he was also had the great fortune in, in being at the California School of Fine Arts, which is now the Art Institute of San Francisco, of being around a host of very other interesting painters and artists, many of whom uh, they all moved here to New York, a bunch of them in the 60s. But he was able to study with some really amazing people and uh, uh, Clifford Still and uh, Frank Lobdell and, um, and then of course, you know, you had uh, Rothko and people from New York who had come out. So he was uh, inspired by and, uh, and, and learned from uh, a lot of the masters and people who we all, you know, know and admire and respect today. But Leo, uh, along with Dean Fleming and a lot of his other friends, uh, Mark DeSouvro from the Bay Area and, and Peter, ended up moving to New York in the early 1960s. And he became a founding member of the Park Place Gallery. And Park Place is, well, it's the Park Place stop on the E-Line, but it's, it happens to be right where the Twin Towers were. And uh, so that was all raised in the late 60s and, uh, and, and developed. 
but uh, at the time when they moved here, um, it was a, I guess, a warehouse area and kind of a broken down area. Yeah, right. <laughs> trains cheap. used to come in from New Jersey on the on yeah. the barges, you know, into those warehouses there. So it was cheap rent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it didn't seem like it, but yes, <laughs> yeah, it didn't seem like it at the time. But uh, we'd all kill for those to be locked yeah, into those rents yeah. now. But anyway, so the, but it was uh, Park Place has had a, a resurgence of interest uh, from a lot of scholarship uh, perspectives, and uh, and just a, just a resurgence in people having interest in, in that whole profound impact that the the artists like uh, Valador and the um, or Valador, I should say, and. Uh, and Park Place Group had on uh, the whole development of abstract art here in New York. So um, Park Place was a, a group of uh, 10 artists, the founding members, and uh, five painters and five sculptors. And, uh, <clears throat> and what sort of held them together was uh, um, not too dissimilar from what was happening in San Francisco in the beat scene. They sort of brought that flavor with them, which was um, jazz and poetry and uh, and art, but they sort of brought in a different element from poetry. It was a little, really a bit more on performance. And it was a, a place where they really wanted people to coalesce. They wanted it to be sort of a nucleus and a, at a point, a place for people to aggregate and, uh, and really see what new cutting edge work was happening and very experimental work uh, here in New York. And that was really their impetus. And the more sort of out there, the better, and uh, as I understand it. And uh, so what really held them though together, a lot of these guys was their interest though, in space and the fourth dimension, the notion of fourth dimension. And, um, and Buckminster Fuller was a huge influence on these guys, uh, vector geometry and the geodesic domes and architecture. And, and so um, that sort of was intellectually and aesthetically what kind of had brought them together and held them together. And you guys can all disagree with me if you like, but as I've understood it and the people I've talked to, we have a really close relationship with Dean Fleming, um, who we represent as well. And Dean was a founding member. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd like to hear other people's perspectives. But that was really the kind of the impetus that, that kind of gelled a lot of them was their interest in sort of space and the fourth dimension. And everybody sort of approached it very differently. So their shows were quite interesting and quite diverse aesthetically, which I think was a, a large part of the appeal. But uh, Leo, though, did move back to San Francisco and, uh, and, did, uh, and continued his work. Some of the pieces, unfortunately, behind you um, are more reductive, and these were some of the first things he did when he got back to San Francisco. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, Everything in the room, in fact, including some of these earlier pieces in the, in the vitrines, it's all San Francisco, I believe. Is that correct? made in San Francisco. Mm, yes, a lot of this work was San Francisco. It either came with, it was, it, pre, it was from the Sixth Gallery, which is where he started in San Francisco, or it was when he f left New York and went back to San Francisco or was produced in San Francisco. So you know, I was gonna say the influence, uh, Buckmeister Fuller, definitely that was someone that you know, Frosty Myers used to talk about a lot and, uh, and everyone. But the other one that I remember, I'm not sure it was Frosty, but uh, Max Bill, who at the time I didn't mm. really know who that was. Yeah. And his name would come up a lot with uh, the Park Place guys, you know? And I always thought that was interesting because yeah. I had to look him up, you know, at that point, you know, see who he was, you know? Because was he exhibiting? I mean, I know that for yeah. some artists like Frank Stella, you know, this was sort of a bet noir, this whole idea of European abstraction and right. geometry and composition, which of course a lot of, you know, the American artists in the early 60s were trying to get away from, and that's part of what led them to, you know, a different kind of geometry, which we now maybe call minimalism, the sort right. of monochrome and the shaped canvas, which, I mean, you certainly see um, in this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Leo's work was definitely about color, and uh, structure, and um, and there's a very much a, a parts of it are very uh, rooted in mysticism, like um, the the circles and the bipartite canvases that he did that were very reductive and minimal when he first went back, called from the East West series, and they were a little bit rooted in sort of a more mysticism and sort of um, his. Um, 
sort of what, what sort of rooted and anchored him, you know, in terms of uh, religiosity and what have you. But uh, most of his work was around color and structure. And I think that's what also made these very unique, all of his work. I mean, there's just really nothing else like his, this work. And um, um, when I look at that one, I see Mangle, but, um, but yeah. that's, you know, with the lines and, and what have you, very reductive. But yeah, it was, um, he was always very interested in sort of this economy of means and, and how to create this tension using, and he saw color as space. That was sort of a phrase he used. And so it was this um, use of color with very um, extreme geometry, you know, uh, you know, vector geometry and angles, which sort of typified a lot of the people in Park Place, yeah. especially for sure Dean Fleming's work. And, uh, and and then this whole you know use of uh, reductive colors and it's amazing how they do they they create this tension this structural tension that feels three dimensional. Well, you can see the San Francisco Art Institute kind of influence in some very very broad general way with the space and color, which is like you look at this painting right here, this red one, and where that line is sort of you could almost imagine it hooking up into a triangle but it stops and it could be behind it mm -hmm. and I see it in a few of the paintings not all of them but something that I I, I don't know what to call it some kind of uh, uh, strange cubism, cubist idea mm. about a space that everyone would maybe start to imply it and then somehow cut it off, so it never quite went there. Yeah. But you could go there, sort of. You know. Well, it's, I think that's what also creates this sort of illusory effect. Um, there's two things operating with that one. The one he's talking about is called Eros is Eros is Eros, and it's a red circle in a, a shaped canvas. It's very geometric. But um, there's two things sort of operating there. One is um, clearly very vib vibrational colors. Right. So playing off of you know what was yeah. happening uh, prior to th this piece, this was in the 80s. Like I think it was in 1980 or 81, um, you know, op art, and mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and then the other is just this what he's been sort of uh, dealing with, which is this as you said, uh, breaking up these lines and creating these sort of illusions where you 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 don't see all of it, and he doesn't give you all of it, but you sort of complete it. A bit of uh, gestalt there's psych a, psychology. There, there's some kind of. I mean, I think I do it myself. There's something that starts to go into another dimension, and you see it in a lot of the artists' work of you know San Francisco Art Institute, particularly. Uh, I also think of like Bob Hudson's sculpture. I don't know how many people mm. are familiar, but when you look at uh, some of what Bob painted on him, I think some critic once described it as uh, something. Alice in Wonderland on LSD or something, you know, where you sort of go down the rabbit hole and you, you know, it, it goes off into some other space, but then it comes back, you know, and there's always this coming mm. back to the surface. Well, I think that's important because, you know, of, of course, another discourse that we're very familiar with at this moment is this sort of Greenbergian idea of the ideal of flatness. Mm. And I think that coming out of, of that sort of dictum, a lot of these artists were, I think, very interested in how you know, you could suggest flatness, but also the sort of subvention of flatness, when I think that's part of the tension you're talking about, where a lot of these works for me sort of, you know, are flat and then they seem to open up and then they snap back. So it's what you right. said again mm -hmm. about this sort of invitation that is then sort of the door is slammed in Canceled your face out in a way. Somehow, yeah. you know? Well, and that's the thing is, I mean, these aren't modeled at all. I mean, these are all very flat colors and, um, but, it was his except maybe this circle, which seems like a something else a yeah. bit with the sort of yeah the translucency clear, the and the sort of impasto. But uh, what I he was playing one. with there yeah, too is the, the raw canvas and texture. <clears throat> this is one of the few times this series where texture really becomes the key factor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's interesting too is hooking up raw canvas with silver, you know, metallic paint. Very, I, yeah, I love very surprising. Yellow. I'm sitting here thinking, yeah. oh, I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a silver yellow. The yellow stripe <laughs> is hot. Uh, it's, it's really uh, quite beautiful the way it kind of glows yeah. on the edge there, you know. But yeah, this was an interesting uh, series, and um, and these two canvases and then their separation. And in this series, there were some that were identical shapes and some that were not, uh, like this one. These were asymmetric. But there was a whole series of these uh, spheres or circles done 
where there was this break around the edge hmm. and um, there were I think five if I'm not mistaken yeah. five or six of them and there were half a dozen or so of these and these were actually shown most of these in um, in San Francisco at the museum there in 1970. Oh really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things you know this was a little bit different this series and um, than the rest of the work and um, but I think what was interesting too is even when they're very flat like I'm looking at between heaven and earth the other thing I'm always struck by is I always want to use the word imbalance but it's not because it's they're perfectly balanced but he was balancing not just shape but using color mm. so that rocking orange fills up a lot more space even though it's only a, a half <laughs> of a square yeah, right. it's a triangular shape the fact that it's triangular and the fact that it is this, this rocking orange color you know amongst those other uh you know less bright colors um it, it really f fills it out i mean it's visually it, it, totally balanced and i think that's what's kind of amazing is he creates this imbalance and tension but yet he uses shape and and he implies perfect balance because there's a half a circle on the one side and half a circle on the other side so implied is balance and so therefore you sort of complete the balance mm -hmm. but yet there's this incredible tension where when you break it down into its components you realize that's really shouldn't be balanced but it is yeah. when well, the complex that's what I was going to ask. Well, interesting you <laughs> should say that. So, uh, yeah, he, there are drawings. And in fact, we've had to reference the drawings quite a bit. Uh, Rio's mom, Mary Valladore, uh, lives in San Francisco. She was out here in New York uh, a month ago when we opened the show, but she couldn't make the trip back. Rio lives here. And Rio's uh, Leo's son. And um, so, yeah, there are several of these paintings. And Leo, just so you know, was pretty detailed and very pretty specific about how he wanted things to be. So even like this little pair right here called Jixtapo, and his, we'll get to his titles too, the titles are fabulous. And um, very simple, but very clever, very witty. And um, he, was, he marks with a red line, which is supposed to be vertical on each, even if there's multiple pieces. So he makes it really clear what is north, you know, what is supposed to be up. And, uh, and, and so then you have to kind of figure out the rest. But he always also tells you what the exact dimension is on the stretcher bar. So he tells you what the overall dimension should be and mm -hmm. the title and all that, and which one's first, second, third, right. or whatever, top, bottom, middle. Yeah, and so then some of them we've had to go back <laughs> because the canvas covers up the, where he had the arrows. And uh, yeah, and there's really detailed drawings, but it was interesting the way he did them. He didn't do them like it was a sketch, you know, with these real details around them. He did them as like there'd be 10 or 15 on a page hmm. and just be very small. They'd be like literally thumbnail yeah. sketches. Yeah. So, but were there schematic drawings that delineate the area of color specifically? Like, no. Like this amount of orange and this amount of green and this amount of Just the outline shape. And maybe uh, Rio could speak to that actually, how he made that final decision because. It wasn't in the drawings. There's a little editing that happened, so you can see it actually on Curveda, which is the one that's on the angled wall facing the front window. And it's a um, square in the upper left corner, and then a, a, a circle that's intersecting a square. And he changed his mind, you can see, on the, uh, on the curve. And he widened it out, and he, he made it bigger. And so um, that was an edit in process, it looked like. And so, but you rarely see that. I mean, rarely. There's no, because these are sun, done so pristine, you, you, there's no room <coughs> for editing. I mean, you would, you notice it very distinctly. <coughs> yeah. Now this one behind us though, we hung it one way. And I kept looking at it and going, okay, this is not right. This just does not make sense because I saw a picture someplace and I don't know where it was installed or who had hung it or whatever, um, but it, um, the upper panel is the way I originally saw it, but the top panel, the black panel, but the top panel, if you go by the way he actually, his indications with the red lines and what's up, that bottom angled piece is actually on top but the problem is it's not a problem i guess but what, what what threw us all off from the picture from where it was previously displayed is it puts too much weight on that side 
and the opticality of the middle part got lost because what happened was it was too many it was too much weight on the right hand side because you can see that's thicker than that side so the left hand side currently would have been on the right hand side but flipped up and so what it did is it made the piece when you looked at it it made it look like this the whole piece but you didn't get that effect of the individual elements now this way and in fact mary found the original sketch and it's this way so that's why we went ahead and hung it this way now i've had clients look at it and i've told them you can do it however you want however you like it there is definitely more tension and imbalance if you do it the way he ended up marking it maybe that's why he changed it from the drawing but um, mary had said you should always go by the drawings though that's how he originally conceived it that's how he did it and so that's how we did it and uh, but anyway th this is a good example though of where there was maybe a change of mind somewhere along the way but now everybody walks up and immediately gets it when they see it that the yellow is like the ground literally the ground uh going you know you're getting this definitely it's it's orienting you to think about perception and then the silver piece looks like it's swinging up into the wall and the black piece looks like it's swinging out of the wall. So if you get enough distance and the chairs aren't in, in your way, if you look at it, it th they look like they're swinging opposite each other in and out of the wall. Now that one, it happens to be a bit more illusory, I think, than a lot of the others. And um, we have some others, you know, downstairs and in, in, out in New Mexico, but, um, and some are really super duper illusory like that. Right. And some look like passageways opening up and things like that. So they're really, they're quite interesting. And each one's very different in how much, you know, it all comes down really when you think about it, uh, how much tension he creates between imbalance and color and, and how reductive he is or in his uh, methodology and how much, how, how, how much you have an active imagination. Is. When I was interested to, <clears throat> to do some research and see that you know, he had in the early 60s arrived at an almost monochrome canvas in a way not unrelated to these, um, which again, these, the viewer cannot see, but you know, these, these sort of uh, bordered paintings. Mm -hmm. And then he had this sort of center dot that seems very interesting and very much oriented towards perception again. And then from that, we have then these, this park place sort of body of work, which has these sort of sharp diagonals, these contrasts of mm -hmm. colors. So I think already in those works, he's clearly, he can see the route to something like a monochrome, but he rejects that in favor of exactly what you're talking about. So it's embedded very early on in, in the work. Well, yeah, even those um, extreme uh, diagonal, you know, the, um, the trapezoids right. from Park Place. Yeah, those are some of my favorites. Along with that shape one where it kind of hooks back. Yeah. Those, I, um, I've always liked those. I think those, I guess the, the real sharp ones were the first time I saw Leo's work as far as New York. I knew, I think I'd heard, you know, Leo's name because of Carlos Villa. He said, he's my cousin, he's a painter. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you get to New York, because it was Carlos that kind of talked me into coming to New York. <laughs> he was like, you got to come to New York, you know, just pack up and leave. And I was like, Okay, <laughs> that's how we got here. But uh, you should give me your Amex card. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you were really gullible. <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, you know, I've been looking at some of uh, Leo's earlier work, which I didn't really know. I didn't realize. I didn't realize he'd gone back that far in San Francisco, like the Gallery Six and mm -hmm. was it Alexi, and those were even gone by the time I was going to the San Francisco Art Institute. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw that black, those black paintings, uh, you know, and I think they had an effect on Carlos too, you know. The, the uh, I was I was telling Leo earlier that how I met Carlos was actually when I was a teenager. I went down to the Oakland Art Museum when it was before the nice museum that it is now, just a little room in a natural history museum, and I walked in. And I saw Carlos's painting. I still can remember the name of it, called Johnson. I remember looking at it, going. Wow, this thing is great. It was. I later found out it was painted with tar, you know, and it was this like, you know, he just smashed this tar on there and whatever. And, um, 
And so when Carlos came to San Francisco, somehow I'd heard he was somewhere, and I, I found him, and I introduced myself, you know, and then we started to get be friendly and all that, and then he said, well, if you, you know, and then I guess I met Frosty. I can't remember what happened first, Frosty or Carlos, but, you know, and then they said, well, you've got to come to New York. And he said, if you come to New York, um, we'll put you in a Park Place show. I said, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> 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 and I was gone. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Leo's work, the, I think the, the, those really long horizontals with the, what, what would you call them, stretched out triangles, I don't you know, mm -hmm. yeah, zigzag, whatever. Oh, which I think, getting back to Max Bill, I think that was somewhat what they were, if I remember Max Bill right, a lot of triangular shapes in hard edge painting. That's... Operating on the square. Yeah, some, I, I, you know. And that flipping, that tension, that flipping back and forth. Yeah. Where there's no figure ground, it's sort of right. oscillating and not resolving itself. Yeah, I, I, you know, because like I said, I didn't, I didn't really know Max Bill's work. At least I didn't remember it from any books I looked at or anything, you know. But I know it now. But well, again, and it's interesting because another group of artists like Frank Stella or Donald Judd would have thought Max Bill was like, say, Albers, a sort of old-fashioned mm -hmm. thing that they would have avoided. But it shows you, yes, the Park Place artists were very interested. I think that's why they start to seem more interesting today is because with time you start to think, but why, you know, were there these sort of what we see retrospectively through the writing of art historians as these sort of clear divisions. But of course, I think a lot of those interests of Park Place, which for many years seemed also very out of step, these sort of engagements with certain aspects of science and maybe even pseudoscience, which, you know, the sort of objective aspect of, you know, a Judd would have sort of rejected. But then you also think like, well, why was Smithson? You know, other figures that we mm -hmm. have canonized, why were they involved, you know, with these artists? But um, well, and uh, Saul Lewitt was a very sure. active member. <clears throat> sure. He wasn't a mem founding member, but... He showed their... He a showed their yeah. a fair I amount. I saw his, the cube that uh, I always thought that was his best piece, and I've always liked that, that, I don't know what, maybe six feet by six feet cube with all the grids, white, you know, maybe mm. one of his earliest pieces, and I always thought that was fantastic, you know, still do. Um, yeah. Well, Dan Graham, when he had his gallery, did a show of the Park Place Arts, which mm -hmm. I didn't realize before researching for this panel. And I, you know, he has pieces by all those, you know, artists in his own collection. I mean, so it just goes to show you that these conversations were much broader than maybe art history has written them to be. And I think we're starting, you know, to understand that. And I think it's why it's good to have shows of work like this, because I think a younger generation such as myself, comes and sees this work and immediately sees both its distinction but also its relationship to, mm -hmm. you know, these better known names. As far as the sculpture goes at Park Place, I think we, what you were touching on and saying is engineering was a, uh, still very much, you know, everybody from obviously Grosner and De, De Suvero and, and Frosty uh, Myers and, you know, uh, whoever else uh, was still very much interested and and Peter, Peter. Mm -hmm. Bill Who? Moser? Bill Bollinger. Oh, Bollinger, yeah. I don't know if he was ever in a show at Park Place. He probably was. Everybody was. Everyone. At one day. Anybody was downtown sooner or later was in a show at Park Place. Were you not in a show, David? Yeah, you were in a show. I remember seeing your work there. Yeah, me too. Really? I'm sorry, your first what? Audio. Yeah. I mean... Well, how did those things, I mean, were they very informal? Yeah, like, for, I mean, literally, Frosty said to me in San Francisco, you know, we'll put you in a show. I was like, really? Did he know what the work looked like? Oh, yeah, we, we, Frosty and I started hanging out together. We were like, you know, this is the days of, you know, we were, uh, Frosty had bought a um, three-wheel motorcycle and I had this studio, and I, in those days I was spray painting everything. I was making like these plywood fiberglass sculptures and, and still paintings that were on the wall. And Frosty said, hey, you, let's bring my, I want to paint my motorcycle. It was a police motorcycle. He said, he wanted to get rid of the police markings. 
So he said, well, let's paint it in your place. And we painted it primer gray. And then we would drive around San Francisco going to the Fillmore. And this is before the Fillmore was, um, you know, Fillmore East or West. This was Fillmore in an old, I guess, theater on Fillmore Street. So we were hanging around, you know, and doing all that. Uh, and then Frosty said, you know, uh, come down to, uh, I'm going to go down, let's drive down to um, Malibu. Virginia Dwan has a uh, guest house there with two, two guest houses and everybody from Park Place is down there. You got to meet these guys. I said, okay. So I went down there and uh, actually I met Chamberlain and I don't know who from Park Place was there, but Chamberlain was there and that's a story in itself. But <laughs> Was it like a show of Grosner or someone? Say, was he the only, well, I guess, Navros also? Well, at the, at the beach house, there was nothing going on except Chamberlain was okay. making those foam rubber pieces in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, you know, I don't even, I can't even remember uh, <laughs> how long I stayed or, you know, <laughs> I mean, it kind of blurred into, then I came back. The only thing I remember is leaving uh, when I left LA, I, I got pulled over by the Highway Patrol. This thing called the Grapevine. I don't know, they still call it the Grapevine, uh, Maria? It's out of LA. There's this big long hill that you go down. It's maybe, it's probably State Highway 5. It goes on for 10 or 15 miles. This big grade. Mm -hmm. So everyone speeds and trucks lose their brakes and they have all these. And so I was doing 90 miles an hour, you know, just mm, cop pulled me over. And I already had my license suspended, like at this point, at least twice. <laughs> <laughs> and the cop pulls me over and he goes, uh, you know, your license. Oh, I forgot to bring my license. And I had absolutely no identification on me at all. You know, very different world, right? And so I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a letter from my mom, and it was in the glove compartment. I show it to the guy, and he says, uh, just get your license with you next time. And when I came to New York, I said, you know, I'm going to get a New York license. I'm not going to tell anyone I had a license anywhere else, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, you know. Can't do that anymore. Yeah. It, it <laughs> Those were the good old days. <laughs> yeah. They, oh, I'm no kidding, you know. I mean, didn't, you know, no computers. No record of, you know, of the fact that I didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> yeah. But that was, you know, Virginia, that was my first introduction to Virginia Dwan, and she was uh, one of the backers of Park Place. Right. Along with Lannon, and I don't, who was the third person? It was three, I thought. Um, uh, who was the Yeah, I think person? it was a third. There was Lannon and Virginia Dwan. was another Dwan, collector. Yeah. And there was... It was another else, collector. Um, also, by the way, uh, Paula Cooper did, uh, but the first guy there was John Gibson, right? Yeah. So he was the first director at Park Place. And then Paula took over the second uh, shift of year. I, I don't remember exactly how many years. I mean, I came to New York in 66, and Park Place kind of disbanded by, what, 68, 69, somewhere in there. Um, but it was a great space, I mean, you know. It seemed big then, it seem so big now. I mean, Sunday afternoons, uh, Frosty, Ron Bladen, uh, uh, Richard Van Buren, you can name a bunch of guys, we'd all show up, me playing tenor sax, Bladen played tenor sax, Frosty played the drums. I think Van Buren would play bass sometimes, violin. I mean, it didn't. I mean, people would just show up, and we would just play all afternoon. You know, free jazz like music. And I used to say it was like a contest to see who could last the longest. You know, <laughs> just play and play and play. And we do do the same thing. Oh, Dean would show up. Uh, of course, Dean was. You know, had a. I love Dean's saxophone. He had this silver sax that was just it had the best tone. You know. Um, and I'd go over to Dean's place because I could walk over uh, all my roofs, you know, and, and hop over, which you can't do anymore. Go down into Dean's place and... Uh, well, that's right, you said he lived on... Yeah. He was on Broom, but it was basically, uh, you know, kind of around the corner. And I would go to his place off the rooftops. How know? do you guys remember? <laughs> I can't even remember my own address. <laughs> 
Yeah, and Frosty, uh, <laughs> well, at that, that point I came, Tamar had taken the, kept the loft. And I, where was Frosty? Was Mulcher. he up on Park Avenue South? Mm -hmm. Frosty may have moved. Frosty moved up to Park Avenue South. Yeah, Tamar had it, because what, what happened, because Frosty said to me, go see Tamara, she'll tell you where to go, and you know lofts, and this, you know, and this, and I, so I visited Tamara, and she said, well, Chamberlain's studio, and I don't know what's going on with that, maybe go take a look, so I took a look at it, and the landlord was there, and it was like right away, I'd seen Chamberlain, I just met him. At 16 Green? No, it, um, uh, this was down Green Street, maybe like, say, 45 or something. Yeah, something. And uh, I remember uh, walking in, I see the landlord, and he, he says something to me like, uh, have you seen John? He owes me money. And I went, no, I haven't seen John. <laughs> <laughs> John who? <laughs> yeah, John. And I thought, you know, this isn't a good start. So I'm not even going to ask this guy anything about, you know. And then I walked down the street, and I saw the sign up in the place I'm in now. And I said, so uh, can I look at it? He said, sure. And he took me up and I said, wow, it's certainly big enough. What do you want? And he said, 250 bucks. I went, oh, $250. No. And I thought about it. I said, you know what? I'm going to see if I get someone to share it with me. You know. 5,000 square feet. Pardon me? 5,000 square feet. Yeah, uh, honest 44, if you actually really get down it. <laughs> we measured it. I had to measure it, you know, officially. Uh, but yeah. It's gone up a little since then. <laughs> You're still there. I'm still there. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm 50, what, 50, is that 52 years or You're so? 50 green. 60. Oh, 60 green. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that was, you know, Park Place group. You know, everybody, uh, you know, showing the shows, you know, uh, I, one of the first shows I saw at Park Place was to Suvaro. And... Uh, With Navros or... I don't remember if Navros was in that show. Maybe he was. I just remember DeSuvero's work more than anything else because it, it it really fascinated me because it was very um, you know what do you want to say you know tough yeah and and very rough but at the same time it had a whimsical quality to it that you know I was responding to and. I remember like there was some big log, you know, monster log on a big spring that you could pull and <laughs> kind of give it a wang, you know, and he had a swing and, you know, stuff like that. You had the honor of being at the bar with his swing. Oh, yeah. I had, yeah, I had a minimal piece that uh, when uh, Mickey decided that, uh, or we Long decided, View Longview Country Club, let's see, the, uh, the Broom Street Expressway slash Long, Longview Country Club. Mickey opened, this is the owner of Max Kennedy, opened a bar kind of across the street on Park Avenue, but a little up, maybe, what was it? Yeah, like a block or so. And the story I heard was that uh, everybody was kind of annoyed that all these um, celebrities now were hanging out at Max's and the place was packed with, you know, we called, you know, like civilians, you know. <laughs> and so we needed our own bar. But I really think Mickey was worried about all these other bars that were opening up, like St. Adrian's, you know, because that was, I was hanging out there. That was a great bar. That was fun. <laughs> but, yeah, in those days, I'd, I'd leave my loft. I'd walk to St. Adrian's. I'd have a glass of wine. I'd look around. Nothing much going on. I'd walk up to Max's. Nothing was happening at Max's. I'd get on the subway, and I'd go up to 46 uh, on the west side to Steve Paul's scene because I had two friends that worked there and I'd get in free. Great music. Jimi Hendrix's uh, After Hours Club. Saw Hendrix play there a couple times. It was, uh, you know. And then after that, I'd get back on the subway, go down to Max's and see if anything's going on there. <laughs> I'd be usually pretty drunk by that point. I'd, you know, either walk home because I was totally broke <laughs> or, you know. Anyway, uh, enough of that. That was the life, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it was a good time, you know. Uh, I teach at the Art Students League, and the other day, some of the kids asked me, uh, well, not all kids, they're actually some were as old as me, but, uh, you know, was that a great time? And I said, yeah, it was, but, you know, kind of glad it's over, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hard to live like that forever. Yeah, I stopped drinking uh, in about 81, December of 81, <laughs> you know, because I, you know, I... Too many Max's Kansas City, Spring Street Bar, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. 
Anyway, back to Leo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I am curious about that Park Place period because one thing that seems sort of specific to that time that doesn't necessarily continue, at least in my knowledge of the work, is this sense of sort of speed and elongation in those sort of many very attenuated shaped canvases that he did sort of in the, in the mid 60s. And the sort of geometry seems to become tighter. And, and as we were talking about these sort of tensions and you know these things that are sort of contained within a sort of set um, parameter, that seems to be maybe a development out of this experiment you know, in the mid-60s with, with speed and, and elongation and things like that. Well, the horizontal was definitely uh, right, you don't everybody. See, I mean, maybe a bit in this piece, but still the overall is a sort of square or rectangle. I mean, I know a lot of guys are talking about sort of, you know, their paintings being fast, you know? Right, and I know that was a thing, you know, especially in Park Place. Yeah, there was... Well, there but was I a, think that was a sort of a... The elongation uh, really comes out of, I think, vector geometry and the whole influence of Buckminster Fuller. But, mm -hmm. but scale also became a big factor. And so some of Leo's, you know, were 12, 10 feet, 12 feet long and, uh, and started out much shorter and chunkier. And so, you know, scale was an issue there. But, you know, Dean was the only other person in Park Place who really explored that extreme angle. That, that really extreme um, wedge, if you will. And, uh, and Dean didn't do it in, his, in, in an array like Leo. And Dean always sort of mixed it up. And so, but that's how Dean got that effect of spinning, of his pieces sort of moving and spinning. Right. Well, some of those Edwin Ruda pieces oh, Ruda's, are quite, well, yeah, yeah, but those Ruda's, diamonds that he did were yeah. But they were much too. more reductive. They were kind right, of like right, this. Right. They were line. Right. Yeah. They, they weren't color. They weren't infused with all this color uh, like Dean and Leo. Mm -hmm. um, I agree, Ruda's were line on shape, and the line was to sort of uh, confuse you um, in terms of the edge or, yeah. the, or, or the angle. So they sort of looked like they were doing this. I mean, they were all trying to, I don't know if it was in, on purpose or, or not, it wasn't because they weren't like the op art artists. They were not in that right. category at all. But there was still this whole uh, illusory effect, and they weren't doing what those guys did. And so, but there, there, I think there is carryover in that, you know, uh, Julian Stansack always referred to activation elements that uh, were things he did across the surface that were either chevrons or ticks or diamonds or something, but it went across the whole surface, and, and he felt that's what activated the viewer's eye, and it mm -hmm. made you open and receptive to the suggestion. And so then, when he would do three values of planes that are sort of slightly twisted, if he just did that, it would just look like three values of color laying on top of each other. But the fact that he would activate your eye with this other color, it made you start wondering how much distance was there between each of those planes. So that's what kind of gave people this illusion of depth and space within those paintings. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting though is with Ed in particular and, uh, and Leo was the, then using the shape, that torqued shape, the, the, um, you know, the parallelogram was really accentuating those angles and creating this tension on the edges. Yeah, that was a word I would hear quite a bit, torqued. Yeah. For the Park Place guys, you know, some kind of, you know. Well, and Ed did that too, so they sort of looked like he went like, <laughs> he just sort of like, you know, <laughs> just twisted it a bit. But it was that effect of that little bit of line that he would do on just otherwise just monochrome painting. But it was so simple. It was just, you know, that's what I think was really cool about all this stuff was it didn't have all this fuss. Right. But it was just this, and, and what it was is they were more perceptual artists than I think they realized they were. Well, and I think in my research on, on the 60s and the sort of broad, you know, spectrum, I think perception was of interest and that's why you have early on people like Donald Judd being very interested, even Ad Reinhardt, very interested in op art. I mean, ultimately it wasn't I mean, for Reinhardt, them, yeah, but they were very interested in these sort of experiments, the way that a painting could affect 
the eye and the body and and they were very much interested i think in then what you're talking about which you know is sort of the other end of a spectrum which i think you can see very much as a continuum in you know you have something like Vassarelli or Stanzak on one end that's much more sort of on the surface affecting but is you know rigorous in its own way and then on the other end you have these what you were talking about this sort of condensation of maybe one experience like you said perhaps it's torque it's mm -hmm. this sort of sense of tension and I think that's what you know a lot of those Park Place artists and also people like Donald Judd or Frank Stella, they were interested in how could you condense and have this sort of singular impact, like not to have the sort of painting popping all over, mm -hmm. like with a Bridget Riley, but this sort of sort of very singular experience that you could sort of, I don't know, fall into and really sort of meditate on as a sort of almost single note sort of held for a long time. And you know, the other people too, who people don't think about, um, we, we've represented and shown a lot of the Washington Color School artists, but people always think of them just sort of in, in terms of just flat canvases and, and color field, but not the case at all. I mean, downing circles, those dots, yeah. those suckers are popping. <laughs> I mean, those things really look like they were vibrating. And the other one that nobody really th thinks much about too is the other thing too that Downing did was his, um, those structures where they look three dimensional. Oh yeah. Those things were stunning and they were so simple, you know, and again, he was, he could have been in this park place group uh, other than the fact that he was creating boxes and structures that have more definition. Uh, it, they weren't as reductive, but they were pretty darn reductive. Uh, but he loved just that simplicity of just one color, three values, and a shaped canvas, and it looked like three planks of wood. You know, I mean, it was just elegant, but it, and it was so stunning. And you catch people all the time. We've had a few in the gallery, and people do. They kind of come and look like this because they just, after a while, they're like, okay, nobody's looking. I'm going to take a look and just, and they realize they're as flat as can be. But it was really kind of cool. And then the other one, too, was like Paul Reed. Paul Reed would do these amazing trapezoidal, extreme trapezoidal shapes that were just flat as could be, you know? I mean, it was mm -hmm. like, and just a few colors, but it was using this spectrum of this, this range of values and then creating just two other uh, lines of color. And it made you think, oh my God, that thing's going on for 10 miles behind that wall, you know? And it was only this big mm -hmm. and it was pretty stunning. And so I, I think a, more of these guys were engaged in that phenomenology and it, they never, nobody really thought about it at that time. Right. But I think when you look back at it now and people like us who, who have looked at these guys critically and, and, and seen these relationships between these seemingly at that time in, in New York and Washington DC as disparate bodies of work, they weren't. You know, there was a lot going on and there was a lot of carryover. Right. And it was, it, so it's, I just think it's very interesting um, because again, I think these Park Place folks uh, and the sculptors were quite different. Oh yeah, Zox was another good example of one. Uh, Neil Williams, yeah. Yeah, Neil Williams, well, yeah. yeah. Well, Neil and, um, and Stella were for sure were the, the shape canvas guys. I mean, they were kind yeah. of... Well, Neil Williams <laughs> did show, I think, a bit with in group shows at Park Place. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm trying to remember. So some of these people were, yeah. I guess, involved. Yeah, yeah, no, Neil. Uh, I mean, Neil was one of the first shows I saw at Emmerich. I think it was the first show when I got here with these really deep structures that, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, his really, work's amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're talking about it, I think um, it seems like artists that, you know, go, going back to California in general, California artists and the idea that it had to be flat was never quite the same uh, uh, rule. I don't know that right, you right. had in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you when you look at a Judd or a, a you know what I call a hardcore Morris uh, minimalist sculpture, I mean they just sit there, boom. You know they don't go anywhere. I mean they, boom, <laughs> you know, I mean the thing is not going to move. Where there's a lot of movement in the other guys, and and mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but I, mean, I think a little bit of how people were, um, you know, uh, if you just look at even just something uh, like uh, abstract expressionism and look what happened on the West Coast versus the East Coast, it's very different. And I think uh, the fact that you, in the West, in the East Coast, it was really the tutelage of a lot of these Europeans who came over and it was still 
you know, very much in that, that rigor and structure. Whereas in California, I think it just, it, they didn't have all the critics. They didn't really care. Yeah. They were all these guys from big sky states. And they, I think they did just have this sort of freedom and independence. And, and their work did look different. And so when you look at those uh, abstract... As much as you did yeah. have Clifford still at the artist. I was going to say, you had these yeah. sort of big... Move. Or I mean, Irwin in L.A. Yeah, and I mean, some hardcore flat paintings. But I think know? that had a huge impact on the students that they had. Oh, and yeah. I, so I, I definitely, I agree with you. I think there was definitely something happening in California that was well, I, I have unlike anywhere else. Sort of, you know, you see Clifford Still, then you see kind of the influence of Still, which I, I always see as eventually working right into funk art. And somewhere along the line, this... Uh, idea of puns, visual puns, and um, what's another word for that, um, came into the work. And you started seeing it like the late 50s in San Francisco, right into the 60s, where guys, like I said, you know, this kind of idea, of, uh, I'm saying even with Leo's work, I mean, I can spot a guy that studied at the San Francisco Art Institute, say between you know, 57 to 66. I can, you know? Hmm. How do you spot it? Usually there's, there's, this, there's this spatial thing going okay. on that is, uh, like I said earlier, it sort of implies it, takes it away, but it's, it is there. Hmm. And sometimes it's really there. I mean, it's, you know, like a guy like Ron Davis, you know. Well, he would be another. You know, that yeah. just, Ron did everything wrong, you know, that you could think of in their beautiful paintings, you know. Um, and well, he was a hugely, again, another hugely influential figure in the sort of late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, Ron, Ron's work I saw the first time uh, at the Richmond Art Center, which was another place in uh, the Bay Area that uh, I found out why later, but for years it just mystified me why they were having these incredible shows. Turned out there was an artist running, he was a curator, I, hmm. I can't remember his name, but he was a conceptual hmm. artist in probably late 50s, 60s. But uh, the first time I saw Ron's painting was uh, a show they had like a biannual, and Ron got, I think he got first place because. Yeah, Richmond? Yeah, in Richmond, hmm. California, which I don't know if anybody knows. I grew up in Richmond for about seven, eight years. It's a really weird town. It's a very rough see town. Far Indian? You can see the spur of yeah. it. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it, what would it be? Uh, it's a little hard for me to think. Uh, End of the Bart line. It's, it's next to Berkeley, but it's yeah. going towards yeah. the bay. Yeah. yeah. Um, funky little town. So here's this Richmond Art Center doing Jasper John shows. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, I was still in high school. I remember going over and looking at it and thinking, this guy's great. Who is this guy, you know? <laughs> but um, Iran had a painting, and again, it was a big stripey sort of thing with all kinds of illusions in it, you know, of third dimension. And again, kind of bringing you back. It may have something to do with Hans Hoffman's influence in, you know, with the push and pull thing. I don't know. You know? Yeah, he was, I mean, that was another guy that I discovered while I was, you know, at the Art Institute. I hadn't really seen his work as far as I remember. A teacher, uh, a guy named Bruce McGraw, doing a color, and uh, he said to me, you got to go see, I don't, you know, I never asked him why he kind of really said to me, you got to go see Hans Hoffman. And I said, okay, and then I didn't. I remember going, oh, God, come here. So a couple yourself. of weeks later, I was like, You know, like, Ron yeah. Davis is a, I'm going to have to do a little bit more thinking about this and research, but actually Ron is probably one of the few other artists that I think has this distinction of like Valador of um, very reductive shape, very reductive palette, but super high visual impact, you know, yeah. and, and perceptual sort of impact. Because I'm thinking of like his, um, the ones that look like they're discs you know, or oh, they're the hexagonal. Octagon, yeah, they're okay, octagons. Whatever they call those do you, things. Are you know who we're talking about? Um, but anyway, um, they're they're so elegant, and when you they're, you realize they're totally flat, they're just like Valdors. They're just flat, and just it's just shape canvas, and simple. 
yeah, they're painted yeah, no, they're, in they're, they're, layers of, yeah. of, of resin, but yeah, all from the back end, so he could never see the final painting until it right. was done. He painted right. everything backwards, mm -hmm. yeah. which is just, I mean, I... His work's pretty trippy. Ron, Ronnie Lanfield and I, had, we were still at the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, I think there was a Bernard show at the Hammer or something like that in L.A. And I said to Ronnie, well, everyone, the Art Institute's going down to see, let's go. And we went and I remember, you know, we stayed. This is another story I won't get into. But <laughs> and I phoned up Ron. I said, Ron, I want to, you know, what are you up to? Because, you know, I liked his work. I saw this stripe painting and I had a little, you know. And um, he said, yeah, come on over. He was on Pico then in this old recording studio. He had these series of rooms that he was working in. And he pulled off one of the um, first of those, those diamonds. They were like a box, sort of boxes right. in a box. And I remember, you know, he pulled it off and uh, he, he had just finished it. And I looked at it and I said, well, Ron, you're on to something here, man. This is, this is some really, you know, I think it was called Seven Ninths Red. He gave me a drawing to it, which sort of... Oh, those ones that sort of look like they're receding. But again, the images... Looks like a platform or a box or, you know, he, he yeah. mixed it all up. It was all kind of What's amazing things. about those is that in photo, the photo the eye of the camera actually resolves them so that they look like they're one thing. But when you see them in person, this mm -hmm. sort of indecipherability is, is really That's why a lot baffling. of that work, you have to use analog photography. You can't yeah, yeah, use yeah. digital. Like it actually yeah. sort of just makes it It tries to like color correct everything and then it sort of flubs it up a bit. No, I think, you know, say is in California, I'm sure other places like Washington, D.C., it seemed like, you know, illusions were fine. You know, making an illusion, well, it's interesting which too separates is from the New York school in that at some point illusion was no, you know, no, no. But illusion. you know, Ron Davis, I think, is an interesting person to bring up in this context because I was very surprised because you know Ron Davis received the support of of Michael Fried, not so much. Greenberg necessarily, but Michael Fried really strongly endorsed Ron Davis. So, and I think this was maybe detrimental actually to the, in the long run because he became associated with formalism. But you had, you know, everyone, Annette Michelson, Rosalind Krauss, you know, Robert Pincus, when everyone, sort of the big names of that time, sounding off and almost debating, oh, is he using one point perspective or three point perspective? Right. And so what interests me about that in this context is how Ron Davis could sort of attract and cement a certain critical discourse, which, for example, Park Place didn't galvanize. And part of me thinks it's, it's a bit about time. You know, Ron Davis, you know, he's, he's living in, in L.A. and starting to show. And then he moves probably like 67 or so to New York and starts showing those those he never moved here. He, he always, never did. No, he was, he, oh, he, uh, I guess he just exhibited a he lot. He actually has a very interesting thing where he moved is once he started making some, you know, really big money with those, you know, first couple groups of the fiberglass, mm -hmm. uh, he actually gave uh, Frank Gehry his first commission hmm. to build a house. And so Ron built this house that was loose, well, not loosely, based on one of Ron's paintings, which was a great, <laughs> <laughs> it was a great house. And it was up in uh, Zuma Beach, which is north of uh, Malibu. Okay. And I visited Ron there a few times. Um, we were going to trade. Uh, never, <laughs> stupid me. I don't know, but <laughs> what happened was I sold the sculpture that Ron wanted. Uh, wow. And that <laughs> ended that, and then, I don't know, got into a whole other thing, and you know how that goes. But, um, uh, yeah, Ron always lived in California. And then he okay. moved out to New Mexico, New Mexico somewhere. Right. Never, He's been there ever. I've never Taos, visited him yet. In, well, actually, in, he lives in Tres Pedres, which yeah. is between Santa Fe and Taos. And it's a, a whole area that's nothing but geodesic domes. Oh, really? Yeah, he, so he lives in a series of uh, geodesic domes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was another one who was very uh, influenced by Buckminster Fuller, like mm -hmm. a lot of these guys, mm -hmm. and vector geometry. When you, when you look at his work, it, it makes complete sense. Right. You know, especially yeah, that it, earlier work that we that, were just talking about, that very illusory work. I think it gets back to that triangle mm -hmm. again. You know, there's, yeah. there's a... Uh, Ron has this drawing he loves by... Oh, God, I'm going to forget. It's a, it's a drawing, you know, old master drawing. Mm by, oh shit, like, I'm, I'm gonna, it's not Fran Angelico, but it's, um, who did the, all the 
spears in the air. You trello, you cello, right? Oh, he actually owns that because a lot of art historians have compared his so perspective. Because Uccello has a perspective plan in the similar circle. There's circle. a drawing yeah, yeah. of an he, he, the Uccello did of a support of a woman's hat in a painting that looks like a Buckmeister Fuller geodesic dome, except <laughs> it's more like a donut, you know. And Ron just, you know, that's like, you know. He, that's his favorite drawing. You know? <laughs> but but I, am, I am interested in this, this sort of aspect of timing because, again, somehow Ron Davis, for example, really hit a moment a bit later in the 60s after, sort of at the, right at the moment that, say, Park Place had closed. And then a lot of artists, including uh, Viador, had, you know, then moved back mm -hmm. west. You know, Dean Fleming also moved mm -hmm. to, to Colorado at that time. So you had, you know, this sort of migration back west right at the moment that in a way maybe the New York art scene and the critical art scene was sort of, you know, they in a way maybe they were a bit tired of minimalism and you have things well, like Larry perverse Bell's another one, though, you know, who was California, Lucy moved Lepard. here to New York and moved back to California. Yeah, was, and he, he's also real good friends with Ron and he lives in Taos. Yeah, and this, so. I mean, it, it, there was like, I guess my point is, you know, there really was a division between sort of the New York school and maybe sort of everyone else in a way, but California for sure. Um, you know, uh, I guess it was an art forum. I can't remember. Was it Morris wrote a basically you know a manifesto? You know what you can do and what you can't do. You know, and uh, you know like McCracken. I mean, I always thought McCracken was great. You know, I remember saying something about McCracken here, and everybody's like, you know, and I think now McCracken, everybody likes McCracken, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. David Warner does. Yeah, you know, you know, that was like okay, you know. But you know, it's funny you mentioned McCracken because I was thinking McCracken, Hammersley. There actually are, and Coral Benjamin, who was called. Oh, that's she's stretching it. But did you see her first stuff? Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the Judy, Judy Garowitz or whatever. Yeah, right. Garowitz. It's yeah, pretty cool the, piece, the thought, acrylic yeah. pieces. No, but I'm just saying is in terms of um, those formal sort of guys, you know. Tony um, DeLapp. Yeah, Tony's another one good one. They're all mm -hmm. California. When I was young, and you know, something like Tony DeLapp looked to me like a whole other world, you know. I was like, Jesus, what's this guy doing? He's got a huge retrospective up right now at Orange County. Yeah, I yeah. saw that. And he's another Frank one. Are you familiar with Leo, his work? He shaped canvases, it? but he also yeah. uh, incorporated a lot of other materials like wood. And he also uh, played with the, uh, um, rounded out the corners and, and angles, but he was very illusory. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of, uh, I think, overlap with some of the early Chuck Hinman work and Tony's mm. work before Chuck started popping it out of the yeah. wall. You know, and because uh, Chuck's another one who was just great at all this sort of illusion uh, with very reductive sort of palette and shape, but um, yeah, this, uh, this, this, I was telling you the other day. You know, those ones I always remember that I liked the best. For some reason, it seemed like white and an orangey red was mm -hmm. a strong. Well, that's the one I'm thinking about. The one that almost looks like a script or scroll or something. And and Tony Delap, because Tony also liked the peaches and corals and and ivory and white and just this little bit of color. And they were flat, but it made them look like they were sort of modeled. But you know, because of the shape, but it was a f totally flat peach color and a totally flat white. But again, you just you saw it as this interesting sort of sort of seductive curve coming out of the wall, you know. And but it was just so simple, and that's what I, I loved about these guys was just this complete simplicity. And and Tony still works in the same studio and does these drawings and everything every day, you know. And uh, he hasn't yeah, yeah. he hasn't wavered one I bit never, from his I never, routine. I never met him, but I remember seeing his work early on. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah. He, you ought to go down and see him. He's in Laguna. Yeah. He's and, in uh, L.A. or Laguna. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he he loves it. Uh, I mean, he he loves visitors. Even, so you ought to go. Guess, was it Fletcher Benton? Early Fletcher yeah. Bentons were very minimalist, and, the, mm -hmm. and then they there was a show. In he was Saturday. a huge influence on G. Chicago. Yeah, there was a show at the Berkeley Museum, uh, Kinetic Art, that was kind of a, you know, the, all that geometric stuff was starting to, you know, mm -hmm. come in. You know, you're starting to see a lot of people. I remember looking at it all as, you know, basically a teenager, and uh, going, oh, this stuff's cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like really liking it. You know. Well, this makes me wonder. You know, we're talking about the New York sort of, you know, scene and and a sort of ever proliferating list and it makes you 
really see you know the the wide range of artists who are engaging with these issues and so Viador would have been part of such a rich discourse mm -hmm. so then I wonder you know and then really in the context of this show for example then going back to San Francisco what then happens to that artistic discourse you know is he working still very much in conversation or is it become a more internal practice you mean know, when he went back Exactly. Yes. Like leaving New York, coming, and then working for another twenty years. Well, and that's or so the part I SF. that uh, would be interesting. That's why I'm trying to pick your mom's brain all the time <laughs> on terms of who did he hang out with, you right, know, who right. who was he talking to, you know, because right. you know here you have people like him and, and other folks who he, he chatted up and talked, and and he and Dean were very close, and so. Um, yeah, but I'm talking about in the 60s, you know, because when Dean left, so did Viador and a lot of these people, Patsy Krebs, a lot of them, they all right. went back to 68. California or Colorado. And um, so, uh, but it's that 80s, 70s and 80s. Who was he hanging out with? And, and uh, no. Was he still seeing Carlos? Was he? Uh, yeah, yeah, right, okay, yeah. Um, but it didn't have that kind of energy in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Carlos was teaching at the San Francisco Art Institute those days. Was was Leo teaching? Yeah, for a time too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw you had did a Jack Jefferson, what, Lobdell, and uh, who was the third artist again? I'm, I'm having problems with Charlie threes. Strong. <laughs> Charlie Strong, who I, I, Ron Davis is very good friends with. And oh, yeah. Ron's shown me a Charlie's few things. dead. He died about oh, really? three years yeah. ago. Yeah. And he's, he's an interesting painter. I can see why Ron really liked, particularly his very early stuff. Yeah. And he was feisty, just like Davis. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So if you haven't been around Ron, <laughs> Well, it's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, right, very careful. That's, that's what I said to some people you know, on Facebook. I said, don't put, you know, the, these, these, you know, growing up in California, you can't help but love cars and get into, you know, being yeah. a gearhead. And I had my share of cars and still do. And uh, I said to some, one of the car things on Facebook, I said, guys, do not write that you went 120 miles an hour, you know, <laughs> down the Nimitz freeway when you were, you know, 17 years old or something. I said, insurance companies, I'm sure, have a way of looking at this stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, but probably not. Or probably, but, who, you know, who knows? Who knows? I mean, you don't take a chance, you know. But, so. Well, <laughs> what I would say about Jack Jefferson was that <coughs> I used to talk to Jack. <coughs> Because I'd get a bad review from uh, <coughs> who did I have in those days? This idiot. This is on recording. <laughs> Lomberg, <laughs> you were an idiot. <laughs> I had this one class with this guy, and, and he would just rip me apart. And I'd feel really down. And I'd go grab Jack. And I'd say, Jack, what do you think? And he'd always he'd get right into it. And he always liked what I was doing. And I think he liked everybody's work. He was a great guy. And um, then I'd feel better, you know. He was the father figure, I think, there. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, he, he, I so, loved his paintings, yeah. you know. Those, there was guys out there, I mean, in a way I feel like I have, uh, you know, this um, <clears throat> history of, um, I know what was going on on the West Coast, you know, firsthand. Then I came to New York, you know, mid-60s, and I kind of know, you know, that. And I knew a little bit about, you know, people, obviously people like Pollock, I knew. You know, I saw the Life magazine article, I think, when I was a kid, you know, and I was like, what's this, you know? I went down in my basement and started dripping paint on a board, <laughs> you know? Thought, really? You and a million yeah. other kids. <laughs> yeah, no, it was sort of, it was funny. We moved into the house in Oakland, and uh, there were these long, I remember, long redwood boards, long, narrow redwood boards, and there was a can of black Duco enamel that had been left there. And I think it said in the article he was painting with Duco enamel. And I remember I looked at it and I started dripping with this friend of mine who wasn't really an artist. He did it a lot better than me, though. It was like it was sort of funny. This friend of mine was really good at it. <coughs> so are there any questions or <coughs> comments from the people here? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, say it again. I've mentioned Stella a few times, but but yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, 
keyboard connecting through the work. Well, it's there. But I'm sorry, what? It was considered too aristocratic and I wasn't. Telling, yeah. Uh -huh. I don't think he was, yeah. He wasn't participating much. In the downtown scene. <laughs> yeah, Kelly is great. I mean. But I, I yeah, he was already you know, Kelly's sort of one another of those generation and a star. I, I always feel like I, I think about his work and I think, yeah. Then I see one. And I'm like. I remember one day I was looking at this L, I forget, it was yellow or something, and I could see it all the way across the street. Even the, the, the of the gallery, the, you know, the, the grill thing, whatever, and I could see it. And I looked at it and I said, why does that attract me so much? You know, what, what, uh, what is it? And I walked over, looked through the window, and I looked at it, and I thought, it's really good. <laughs> you know, it's like I can't say anything. It's just an L hung upside down, you know, and I'm looking at it thinking it really works. I don't know why. Is it the height? Is it the color? Yeah. Well, that's, you know, the, the issue of influence is, you know, that's a big one. Well, you know? and this is a question, I think, for this work, too, this aspect of proportion. You know, it seems simple, quote unquote, mm -hmm. on first glance, but to make work like this is very difficult because it is about all. And I think this is why these questions come up of does he use sketches? You know, how does he plot it out? Mm -hmm. Is he, you know, planning the color and the density of color? Because all those relationships matter. And of course, why is Ellsworth Kelly a great artist is because he has tuned all those things so Precisely, and I think you could say that about this this work as well. Yeah, I think yeah, Leo got there, you know, definitely for sure in the '70s and '80s. You know, I, you know, I know that there was such a, I think, so much happening here in New York around people, and, and in the '60s in general, like with Tony DeLapp out in the West Coast and everything around. Um, everybody was obsessing with the edge of the canvas and obsessing with shapes of canvas and really defining what, what was, you know, why constrict a, a picture to, you know, this preconceived idea of a rectangle and, you know, and a window under the world and all that. So I think, you know, I don't think, uh, but you know, the, w w now we have, you know, Instagram and all these things and we see all this stuff. And sometimes you, you do even remember where you saw something, you know, or whatever. Did I imagine it, you know, or whatever? It's like I was telling you about the picture from Paris. <laughs> but, yeah, so, um, but, you know, there was none of that, it, it, you, know, he, you know, at that time. But the other thing, too, is the art world was much smaller in New York at the time. I mean, you could go to every show that was happening with abstract painting in one evening. Now... You know, you you couldn't yeah, even yeah. go to four in Chelsea in an evening. You know, I mean, it's much less go anywhere else in Manhattan, and so it's. Um, I don't know. I just I, I I haven't come across where anybody's ever talked specifically about Leo's thoughts about Ellsworth Kelly, I just think or yeah, yeah. But I'm thinking well, back. He would have been showing every year. It would have been in the galleries too. Right. But I'm thinking about in the '60s, where it would have been uh, the most influential. Leo was his uh, migration from a you know uh, from Abex was pretty much right away into long rectangles and then trapezoids, which really wasn't what Kelly was doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, these have to be from the 80s, but anyway. If you look at the mid-60s, everybody's doing Frank Stella, uh, irregular polygons. You see everybody doing, there are a hundred people doing a version of that. And some stand out more than others, mm -hmm. some disappear. But everybody is, is, you know, making bands and making bands. Yeah, it depends on what you do with it, you know. I mean, thinking of Ron Davis, you know. I mean, uh, very, you know, Stella and, I mean, actually, uh, first, first group of Ron's work that, and I'm not sure I knew David Novice's work at the time, but there was some kind of funny, superficial, you know. And then Ron, now I look at it, and I wouldn't even start to mistake uh, 
David say L's and talk about very flat mm -hmm. where even Ron was doing something that you know there was always that little bit of uh, illusion could be illusion in, in quite a few of them and then of course he progressed on where that became you know the subject of, of a lot of his work you know but I think that's that's a uh, that's, you know, where, where is it okay and where is it not okay? I did something yesterday that I thought looked like somebody's work. Just kind of accident, just happened. And I looked at it and I looked at it and I finally said, screw it, I'm destroying it. And I did, you know? Well, the image is so pervasive nowadays. And um, whereas in the 60s, it was experiential. You kind of had to go to the show. You know, but uh, I, you know, I'm and, very interested in this question of reproduction because I think you even brought it up. I think a lot of artists, I mean, and actually Stella is the same way. He talks very much about how he was at Princeton, you know, close but not quite New, New York, and he saw Jasper Johns in reproduction on the cover of Art News. And you have a lot of these stories of that generation encountering art. I mean, of course, then they had to go, and the experiential is undoubtedly. Mm -hmm hugely important and in a way it was sort of omnipresent because I think people went from studios to shows to the bar and you know it was sort of a free flow of, of objects and ideas that certainly is not so much true today but I am very interested in the role that these images played I think a lot of very you know early sort of ideas about art that weren't even maybe conscious people you know and that's why I think like how does you know an artist like this for example move to the monochrome in San Francisco, I imagine maybe something like art magazines played a role, potentially. I mean, I know, for example, David Navros told me that, you know, that was a big impetus being in LA and, you know, not only something like Duan Gallery, but also seeing these magazines and thinking, oh, well, New York, you know, and this is what they're doing. I'm seeing it in the magazine and maybe a tiny sampling at Duan or That's something where I like that. That's where I first saw Frosty's, Forrest Myers' work was in, in I think magazine. it was Newsweek. Uh -huh. There was a big article on maybe even Park Place, I don't know, but there was Frosty there with a sculpture of his kind of front and center. I was mm. like, wow. Well, I think one of the things guy? with uh, Leo, and it's really a shame, there just isn't more work from the 50s available. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to have seen the, some of those paintings he showed at the Sixth Gallery. I just only saw two images. Uh, yeah, you know? and I think what was interesting though about his work was he, like a lot of the West Coast Abex people, um, the work was a little different than um, being purely sort of emotive um, it, uh, and just part of it, you know, just you, um, like on, and sort of what people think about when you think about Pollock and, and um, de Kooning and people here in New York. There, it seemed like, and Jack Jefferson was a good example. Um, shapes appeared, you know, Frank Liddell was a great example. I mean, forms, all sorts of, you know, distinct forms appeared, you know, and he was all part of that canon. And he did something interesting but, with the forms, was how he, you know, talking about edges. The uh, first time I saw Jules Zalitsky's work, I said, this guy must know Lobdell. And which yeah, is a weird kind of stretch to make, because Lobdell's <laughs> so symbolic, you know. Mm. But when you look at what you know, Lobdell was doing those, you know, particularly sometimes these big seed-like forms that would just yeah. crest the edge and some kind of, you know, jagged little thing on, you know, on the side. But it was contrived. I mean, it was, that was my point, it was thought out. I mean, there was a, there was a, there was like a plan. And I think Leo had a bit of a plan, but like all these young artists like he was, they were edging away from abstract expressionism. They wanted to do something different. And um, the worst the thing ones. you could say at the San Francisco Art Institute, if when you get your fellow artists, students, and you know, have go look at your work, which we all did, looks a little ab X to me, and that just killed you right there. <laughs> you were dead. <laughs> but I think that's why Leo was already starting to play a lot with um, extremes and um, values. You know, the use of chiaroscuro and just the fact that he. The, these orbs and swirls, and, I, and I'd love to find out if he actually knew Matsumi Kanemitsu. And yeah. uh, Kanemitsu was another one who was New York, California. And, um, but he was in LA when he moved out there. But um, his abstract expressionism, and he was part of the, you know, the group here, the Cedar Bar group, but 
um, and he was real good friends with Pollock, but his work was distinctly different. You probably knew him. And because, uh, well, you probably, yeah, you're not old enough, but didn't know him. But he, um, his work was distinctly different in terms of abstract expressionism. And, and it was bringing in uh, his, these, you know, Asian influences. Right, and, and, say, uh, Mark and, Toby, too. With yeah. The, you know, and so I'm kind of wondering if there isn't a little bit of that with Viador in terms of just... Um, just bringing in this different cultural sense uh, sensibility, um, you know, because his paintings were they were very different. They were also smaller scale, and he certainly made up for scale as he got older. That's another thing I'm very in intrigued with is the scale. Yeah, the scale just got huge, especially as he got older. I mean, these this last group of paintings they're like eight by eight, ten by ten, ten by twelve, ten by fourteen. I mean, they're mammoth, and so they're <laughs> Don't stunning. Don't say that. It's mammoth. <laughs> and so you know, it's uh, so, but really, no one's ever talked about that. And I've been trying to pick your brain about that in terms of just you know, what is this scale thing? You know, I mean, and so it, it was sort of interesting. Well, you know, some of it's what you can do. You know, I mean, I know. I'm well, yeah, I mean, that's always been a part of abstraction. You and know, so, what, what you can do on such a big scale that doesn't really come off so well at a smaller scale and in some ways Pollock's a little bit of an issue with Pollock was a small Pollock just isn't quite the same thing you know. Well how big were the the Park Place pieces? Well but they they varied I mean some were 12 10 12 feet long. Okay, so I mean some it seemed large. really big in those days yeah, right. which I would say yeah. a big painting was maybe you know nine foot high six foot wide I mean how, what were you painting Dave? You were painting like eight ten foot paintings right? <laughs> but I mean, I remember those paintings being uh, over at, um, you know, across from Finale's, what was Paley and Lowe? Was that pa Reese pa Yeah, those, that show, I remember, the, they looked big to me. Yeah, <laughs> 12 foot maybe? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe 7 by 11. That's big. Seven by eleven, yeah. Well, it's bigger than you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, part of the whole thing is uh, it's something that's always interesting to think about is, uh, you know, what what you can do at a small scale versus what you do at a larger scale. And I've been myself, you know, playing a lot about, particularly the smaller ones. Um, you know, what I'm going to do at a smaller scale versus the big scale. The big mm -hmm. scale, I, I, I do everything I can think of. <laughs> I just, you know, kind of, I mean, not totally, but, you know, I can kind of go nuts. Uh, the smaller it's scale... It's harder to pull off a small painting. It, it, for me, it is. A successful small painting. Um, the small ones, uh, I don't know. I, at one point, I was thinking, like, maybe they should just be little details of the big ones, you know? That didn't work out so well, you know. And then I started thinking, well, maybe there'd be just little small versions of the big painting. And that didn't work out so well, <laughs> you know. So, you know, but I have pulled some off. But it's uh, if it was up to me, I'd paint it ten feet all the time, constantly. The body's still got to body back. <laughs> there, there was, you know, at the end of Leo's life, he did. Have, he went back to a series of very, very small pieces. Hmm. Really? They yeah. Were doors Masonite type of oh, yeah. materials, mm. and they were like an enamel, enamel type of things, like shiny, shiny, mm -hmm. very, very distinct thing. A lot mm. of that was the practicality of the cost of the materials that yeah. we get at the time in San Francisco. Uh, so it was like kind of a banality sometimes, <laughs> of just like, well, I can just get a bunch of work very cheaply down at the hardware store. Yeah. Oh, yeah, $8 a sheet now. Paint on them, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. it just they became very different vocabulary. Man, you have to rethink it all, you know, like what, what... Well, he did those cutouts to, towards the end there, the, that were real, he went back to that, the zigzag shape, and I forget what some of the titles were, but they were on plywood and masonite, and they were like jigsawed out and, and stuff, and I mean, I mean, pretty cool little things. Even thinking of those really long horizontal ones with the, we say, I'm going to call it a triangle stretched out. I mean, what I always liked about those when they got big was on the edges that color started kind of getting out of focus and, you know, hovering a bit, you know, and I always thought that was very cool, you know. Mm. 
But again, um, it gets back to these illusory effects. I mean, it's again, it activates the viewer's eye to an extent. I think this was a trick. They didn't know what it was, but they knew it worked. Yeah. And so there was something about it, you know, and also it created a, a, an atmospheric effect. So when things go to oblivion, it becomes atmospheric. Yeah. And so, you know, no, again, it gives you this sense of something's really far away because it's so out of my focus now. And so you don't know that you're not processing it that way, but that's the effect you have. And so you get this very keen, strong sense of perspective. You, the viewer, can't understand it or don't necessarily dissect it unless you're an art historian or something, but, but that is the effect. And, and they, they didn't think probably about it that in, in an engineering sense per se, but, um, you know, but that was the effect and it, and it worked. And they knew these things just seemed wonky with that when, when they did that. And, so I think that's, that's why I think there were more of these things happening with these people who we thought were just pure formalists than we realize, you know, right. and because um, they, they may not have had the right words or thought about it in that way, but they were pushing the edge, you know, even though um, well, I think it looks, they weren't in that group of people at the time. It looks, it looks more, uh, I mean, first it looks more acceptable and all that these days uh, in, in a more mainstream kind of thinking or establishment thinking, but um, I think it's the way that, you know, everyone had to go at some point, you, you know, you couldn't just make that, you know, box in the middle of the room, something had to move somehow, yeah. one way, yeah. or it dies, you know. I, I, I once heard this thing, I, I don't know how exactly this relates to art, painting, or visual art, but uh, the whole thing about jazz and Somebody said, some narrator on a documentary I was watching said, you know, when, when you couldn't dance to the music anymore, that's kind of when jazz died. And I've been thinking about that with painting and sculpture, you know, what, what would kill it off? What, what is like dancing to painting, you know? Um, as much as I remember Frosty once saying, yeah, we'll be dancing in Ornette any day now. <laughs> and I always, I always thought that was like <laughs> Frosty. And you know, it is kind of funny. I can dance to Ornette now. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, and that was another person, by the way, thinking of Park Place. And boy, Ornette was really an important, uh, you know, uh, jazz musician in, to, to all of us. But it, it was at the Park Place group that, you know, that was a... Jelly, I remember like going with Frosty and God, I don't know who else. We were going to go to Slugs, I think, one night. And who was it? Got shot there like the week before. And I was going, you sure we want to go there? You know, <laughs> it was like, you know. Any more that, that you wouldn't go anywhere. That <laughs> yeah, that it, was, it was like, uh, what was his name? Uh, I think it was a trumpet player. Lee Morgan. Yeah, Lee Morgan got shot mm -hmm. at Slugs. I think they killed him. But music was very important. I mean, you mentioned, again, the way that the, the artists themselves were musicians, but I was also interested to see that, you know, uh, certain minimal musicians like Steve Reich would do right. early performances. So there was... Steve Reich put a performance at Park Place uh, with Chuck Ross. I don't know if you're familiar. Charles the, Ross plexiglass. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, these sort of... Uh, so he had the plexiglass volumes. pieces around. And, um, yeah, I was interested. I met Chuck... Chuck Ross in uh, San Francisco. He was sort of the first artist I ever met that wasn't making some kind of abstract painterly painting. You know, it was like, hmm. Well, you know? He was close to Heiser, right? Right, well, so I met him through. Yeah, yeah. His mic took me over there. He said, I want you to meet this guy. And I thought, oh, okay. It was interesting. Yeah. Doing these, like, I guess these prisms, a rainbow mm -hmm. like effect would come through. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, it's pretty interesting stuff. Well, we probably should wrap it up. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and um, and uh, this will be posted. We'll uh, and uh, Tomer will help do some snippets and things like that. So we'll uh, have shorter versions and what have you. But uh, you can always look at these on um, YouTube, our YouTube channel, and uh, issue. So. Okay. And we'll send it out to in another newsletter so that everybody knows how to get a link to it. But um, anyway, great. Well, I appreciate everybody coming. Thank you guys very much. Uh, oh, really thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Thanks. Thanks.